uh, a company is uh, at, involved with Los Alamos National Laboratory. So it's another collaboration between ISS National Lab, Los Alamos National Lab, and its partners to better understand how microgravity impacts the gut microbiome and the human body. Microgravity certainly an impact on astronauts the entire time they're out there. And we've been studying this for so long, and it's great to see a study that's uh, looking at uh, those internal functions of the gut. Uh, it would be fascinating to see what comes of that. Um, as we truck along here, I, I understand that we now have science on board the actual Crew-5 vehicle. That's not something that's always I been capable of uh, happening, right? We do. Uh, for ISS National Lab and all of the sponsors of the International Space Station, the availability of actual crew members going up on commercial crew has been a significant advantage. We've doubled the amount of time that's available for crew to conduct science. But also, we have the ability to utilize the crew vehicles to get some science up there that can fit within the confines that's not occupied by the crew. So while most of our science and supplies still go up on the commercial resupply vehicles, we're also able to utilize the vehicles themselves that are taking the crew up to get some expedited science up and get it back. And we're looking at some video now of Lamb Division. You can tell me a little bit about that. Another very important uh, uh, development in space is the utilization of space and access for commercial companies. So Lamb Division is a small startup, startup biotechnology company that is pioneering the use of bacterial rhodopsin, a protein from bacteria, that can be used to manufacture artificial retinas. So Lamb Division is utilizing the absence of microgravity to improve their ability to manufacture these artificial retinas in space. These artificial retinas, when they're approved for use by the FDA, will enable Lamb Division to offer the availability to recover from retinitis pigmentosa and macular degeneration here on Earth. Currently, there are no effective therapies for that like, that recover like full sight or full vision. Uh -huh. This technology offers that advantage. Offering a lot of hope uh, for people who suffer from those diseases, and so it'll be exciting to see what kind of results come from that experiment. It is, and Land Division's had the opportunity through ISS National Lab and, and NASA to operate four different experiments in space. So. This new era of easy access to space for supportive science that benefits here on Earth is really turning into to some new great dividends for people on Earth. Mike Roberts, Chief Scientist for the ISS National Laboratory, thanks for being here and sharing your knowledge about the science on board the ISS. Thanks, Daryl. All right, as we continue to watch the operation and our team check through the milestones here, we will toss it back out to Houston. Actually, we're going to throw it to California and Hawthorne, where Sandra and Jesse are standing by. Thanks, Daryl. Earlier, we did talk about the progress that both NASA and SpaceX have made in human spaceflight since we first started flying Dragon regularly over 10 years ago. So to support our increasing number of human spaceflight missions, your spacesuit team has been busy at work, Jesse. <laughs> yes, we have. You might be surprised to know that the completion of the Crew-5 suits marks SpaceX's 50th completed IVA or intravehicular activity suit, including development, training, and qualification suits. 30 of those suits were created for flight. This number is inclusive of the suits that the Crew-5 astronauts are wearing today. 17 of the 50 were built and used for development and training. One was used to get our suit qualified for space, and we produced suits to support the passengers for a couple demonstration missions as well. You may recall Starman and Ripley. Starman flew on our first Falcon Heavy fight flight in 2018 and is still flying around out in space. And Ripley was the anthropomorphic test device that flew on Demo 1 to help us collect lots of data before flying Bob and Doug. And as a reminder, this spacesuit that you've seen the crew wearing throughout operations today is an intravehicular activity suit designed for use inside Dragon. Its primary function is to protect the crew in the event of a cabin depressurization. Now, when the astronauts move onto the International Space Station following docking, the spacesuits will stay on board Dragon. The astronauts will then use NASA's extravehicular activity or EVA suit when outside of the International Space Station performing spacewalks. The suit teams work tirelessly to make sure all of our astronauts have a positive experience while wearing our spacesuits and ensures the highest level of safety. 
Now, similar to how we innovate and further develop our launch vehicles with each tester mission, our spacesuits have continued to evolve since NASA astronauts Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley first donned them for Demo 2. Some improvements include the patterning process for better fit. Patterns are the individual pieces of fabric that go together to create the suit. Our process involves taking measurements, generating patterns based on those measurements for each layer of the suit, and then performing fit checks where we put together non-flight quick versions of the different layers of the suit to make sure that they fit correctly before making the flight suit. And we've also continued custom patterns for each crew member and have made significant reliability upgrades in the spacesuits. And while the suit is a single piece, which means the helmet, gloves, and boots all remain attached as one piece, with us today is a SpaceX helmet lent to us by the spacesuit team, and you can see it here on the table right now. That's right, Sandra. This helmet is made from 3D printed nylon and has a visor that pivots open. And Dragon SpaceX for side hash leak checks. Okay, Josh, uh, we identified a uh, potential piece of FOD on the side hatch seal when we were inspecting everything, so the closeout team is proceeding to open the hatch to address that before closing and re-performing the leak check. For big picture awareness, we still have approximately uh, 12 minutes remaining in the margin for this timer to perform this action, so... We'll, we'll be able to run through everything with uh, our issue here. Okay, Dragon Copies will be opening up the side hatch and uh, taking a look at the pod. We've got 12 minutes of margin. Appreciate the heads up. Good readback. So we just got an update. We were closing the hatch. It sounds like they do need to do another inspection, reopen the hatch, reinspect uh, the hatch lining, make sure that there's no FOD caught in there, and then perform the procedure to reclose the hatch one more time. Uh, it sounds like we do have some margin, um, 12 minutes of margin, so we are still on track for liftoff today. Uh, but as we were mentioning, the helmet is made from 3D printed nylon and has a vi visor that pivots open. It's also equipped with a microphone, which is embedded into the helmet, which allows the crew to communicate with the mission operators while suited and seated in Dragon. That's right. And those communication systems that you were talking about, you can see um, inside. They're not inside this helmet because it's not going to be used throughout the mission. Um, but the crew does have the ability to hear via the helmet. Um, and you can see the slots right there uh, for, for that capability. Yeah. Um, and so now we're going to check in with Kate while the team is working on the hatch. So Kate, how's it going over there? Thanks, Jesse. Yeah, it's super cool to see that helmet up close. Uh, now turning our attention back to the progress with the integrated launch teams, uh, we are coming up on T minus one hour and 32 minutes. Uh, as we just heard a couple of moments ago, the closeout team identified uh, a little bit of FOD in that hatch seal. Um, so basically the process is we close the side hatch, we inflate the seal around the hatch uh, to a certain pressure, and then we hold that pressure to see if there's any decay or leak. Um, and if there is, that's an indication that something is in the seal, and that's what occurred today. So the team is in the process of reopening the hatch. They'll clean the seal out, close it and inflate the seal and re-perform that leak check. Uh, so normal, as we heard mentioned, we do have 12 minutes of margin in the launch countdown. As I've mentioned before, the countdown is to make sure that everybody is, uh, all the integrated launch teams are aligned uh, and we do build margin in in order to make sure that at, we can deal with things like this as they come up. Similar to whenever uh, pilot Josh, Josh Cassida had um, a little bit of decay, or excuse me, not decay, a lower pressure value red on his suit, so we rechecked the, uh, the suit pressure there as well. So working through those, uh, no issues. We're still tracking for an on- Uh, pre-launch nap. Uh, I don't know <laughs> is, if I personally napping. would be able to pull that off, so I really admire the calmness she is napping. she's <laughs> demonstrating today. They just today. confirmed it. Um, so once that hatch is <laughs> closed back up and we successfully uh, leak check on that, 
Her name is uh, Anna. Good to go. Uh, this is Anna the Napper. <laughs> Uh, as for the launch engineers, they are located in firing room four in the NASA Launch Control Center at Kennedy Space Center. They have a view uh, through their large windows of pad 39A, which is located just five kilometers east of them. Uh, currently, the Falcon 9 team is loading helium and nitrogen gas into storage bottles on the launch. Oh, they're starting to, uh, they're loading gas. They're doing that last, some of that shit's combustible. Oh, and they're also for that uh, rubber check. What they do is they take air, and then they they'll do like a pressure test to see if the the air will hold. It was more so to um, make sure that the air pressure is correct, or that there's no leaks, which is uh, indicative of a cut. I would think it's more for like leakage. So if, it, if they do like a water landing, it, it'll hold. God forbid they, uh, you know, whatever. If they have to do a emergency crash into the ocean. I was thinking they, so they don't drown. But, uh, now at you know, just under T minus an hour right. and 30 minutes or so. So weather continues to be green. As you can see, beautiful clear day at pad 39A. But we are, of course, monitoring weather uh, at downrange as well. And that continues to look good. The range remains green and ready to support. So uh, all that being said, we are on top of launch in under an hour and a half from now. Uh, and we are certainly getting excited here in Hawthorne. Uh, with that, let's turn it back over to Daryl and Bob at Kennedy Space Center. How's it going over there, guys? All right, thank you very much, Kate. And we continue to monitor the work that the closeout team is doing right there, uh, checking, rechecking uh, the seal, the dragon, and the hatch, and the spacecraft. And there you can see the text making that inspection now, taking a light around it. They had the hatch closed, but reopened it oh, after doing the side hatch recheck. And Bob, it was interesting we were talking about this uh, just recently before uh, Kate came to us. And there's a way they can check that seal to see if there's any fog in it. And I thought it was interesting how they do that. Yes, uh, Daryl, I Kate gave a great explanation of uh, that process uh, just a couple minutes ago. But what they do is they, they need to find a way, of course, uh, before you get into space to make sure that the integrity of that seal is good. And so what they do is they're able to inflate a small portion, a, a small volume, to ensure that they do have a good pressurization on the sides of that seal. And if they do have a leak or, or some indication that things aren't exactly right, you know, the most likely culprit is some sort of foreign object that's kind of captured in that seal and surface. And so if he goes back in, leaves that area out, and uh, then we'll kind of reaccomplish that leak and make sure that it's there before the crew gets into the back of the space with the space And you can see they've wrapped up that process of inspecting, cleaning, and documenting the seal. And now they've reclosed the side hatch to Crew Dragon with our crew five astronauts inside and they'll start sealing up the hatch now. We'll keep monitoring the action and let you know what's going on. The Dragon, the team's for got a quick update, the closeout team was able to open the side hatch and remove the uh, hair that they identified as FOD. They've closed behind the side hatch and are stepping into their leak checks right now. We are right on schedule for launch today. Okay, well, there you heard confirmation that they found what it was. And real quick, Bob, before we throw it to an interview, a hair was identified. Fascinating to me that something huh. as they small found a as hair. hair that can you've been on the space shuttle. A seal. Yes, it's, uh, it's really important that that area is super pristine. And, and like we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, that hatch is going to be closed for six months as they make their way into orbit and then uh, won't get open until they come back and are on a board to the ship. And the ground is going to be commencing a health check for launch escape system a second time. Expect a momentary flight computer state change, followed by that transition back to pad hatch closed. Dragon copies will cut again prior to going back to pad hatch closed. Good read back. We will keep monitoring the action here outside the Dragon spacecraft. You heard the launch escape system checks are coming up momentarily as they continue to secure the side hatch. In the meantime, let's go out to Megan Cruz, who has a very special guest 
Lieutenant General Thomas Stafford, one of the 24 astronauts we sent to the moon. Megan. Yes, Sarah, I'm very excited to have um, the Lieutenant General here with me today. Uh, I mean, it's just, I'm so honored to be sitting next to you here. I wanted to ask you, is this your first crewed launch that you've seen? Oh, no, no, Megan. Uh, I was here before when we had commercial launch number two. Always just love to see a launch. Absolutely. Had it done for a mission. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, does being here, does it make you kind of reminisce on, on those four missions you've had? You know, you're a part of the Gemini and, and Apollo programs, and we actually have some, some pictures of you from those missions that we'd love to share with everyone. Can you talk us through They, have, they have a guy who went to the moon. So apparently <laughs> 22 right people have gone to the moon. We've landed on Gemini 9. That was in June 6, 1966. There's Gene Cernan, my pilot. He's the first one to walk in space completely around the world. We did three different rendezvous on that. And we also touched down closer than any Gemini or Apollo. Wow. So and then we have another picture, actually. This one's from Apollo 10, right? And that's you, the second astronaut um, farthest from the uh, transport van, right? Right. So the, you know, that was a great mission. It was the first uh, lunar module to the moon. And I did the first... We were too heavy to land, or we might have had a chance to be the first ones to land on the moon. But we were too heavy to land, but we went out to nine miles above the lunar surface. Photo map, radar map, and visually map, picked out an ellipse that had three potential landing sites. We did that twice and came up and did the first rendezvous around the moon. Yeah. And then on the way back set the all-time world speed record. At this this picture is a little blurry, but it's honestly my favorite of the three pictures. Can you tell us what's happening here? You guys are on your way to the moon here, right? We're on our way to the moon. We're walking slow to, walking slow to the transfer van. <laughs> but then on the way back, we're doing uh, well, 24,791 miles an hour, or Mach 36 miles per second, Megan. Seven miles a second. Wow, wow. So that record still stands. Wow. You know, we're talking about the Apollo 10 mission and, 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 and the work that you guys were able to, to establish to get us where we are today with our Artemis 1 moon rocket right behind us in the Vehicle Assembly Building. Are you looking forward to the Artemis 1 launch later this year? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I've worked on helping getting that through Congress back in 2010. That's the authorization that authorized it. So, I've, yeah, I've had 12 years of work on that one. Yes. Lieutenant General, thank you so much for being here, and I hope you enjoy the Crew 5 launch today. Oh, it's great to be here. The weather's good, and I'm sure you're going to have a great launch. Today. Thank you so much. All right, Daryl, we'll send it back to you. Wow, well, that was fantastic to hear from the Ground Lieutenant Dragon. General. I'm clear. Stand by for comp check by launch control. Dragon, launch control on countdown one, comp check. Launch control, Dragon, loud and clear. Launch control, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by the chief engineer. We're getting comm check Dragon, right CE now. on countdown one, comm check. Listening in. CE, Dragon, loud and clear. Victory. CE, loud and clear also. This completes the Falcon 9 responsible engineer comm checks. There will be a series of these checks. Establishing a number of communication paths to the crew from launch control. Want to just uh, update you really quick. We got a good side hatch leak check. Again, a good side hatch leak check after some FOD was found that compromised it following the first closure. Teams went back in, opened the hatch, cleaned off the seal. Shut the hatch back, rechecked the seal, and we are good to go. Again, good side leak, side hatch leak check, and we're moving forward now with the comm checks. The SpaceX team working quickly. They had 12 minutes of margin. They whittled that down to about three or four minutes. And so great job by them. Tackling that issue that can pop up as you're preparing to launch a spacecraft to the International Space Station.
There's the Falcon 9 rocket on the pad with the Dragon spacecraft atop. We've got a beautiful day. Nice skies above. Take a little moment to listen to a special message now from somebody who's familiar to both of us, more him than me. Our previous co-host from the last crew mission, Crew 4, and the launch broadcast, a very special person to all of us here. Let's take a listen. Hello, husband. It looks like you're doing a great job with the launch commentary. Keep up the great work. It seems like all those tips that I gave you are paying off. Um, a couple of things I forgot to mention, though. You should probably share some of your snacks with Daryl because he does get a little hangry if he doesn't get enough to eat. And also, it's important as the co-host to make sure you laugh and smile at all of his jokes. It makes him feel really good. Um, actually, there's a couple other people in the family that want to say hello to you as well. Just give me, just give me one second. Do a good job, Daddy, or else I will find new ways to motivate you. In all seriousness, though, Nicole and Josh and Koichi and Anna, I want to wish you well on your journey. You guys have worked so hard to get here. You're going to be absolutely outstanding on the International Space Station. I cannot wait to see you up there. We're going to be cheering you on from down here. Have a blast, and we'll see you when you get home. What a beautiful message. She's so good with the camera and giving the message. Thank you so much to Megan MacArthur for saying that. By the way, I've taken care of myself. I've got my food here. But uh, it's so good to see her and, and uh, a little touched by her message. No, it was absolutely great to see my wife, of course, our, our dog Shadow, who arrived in our family after we uh, returned from the Demo 2 mission. You know, my son requested Dragon approval. SpaceX, we just had a good side hatch leak check. My son requested a approval Dragon copy. That is great news. to have a dog when uh, the mission was accomplished. And so that was pretty cool to have the dog included. And, of course, uh, Darth Vader <laughs> making a guest appearance, uh, not something that I expected. But uh, that costume has a little bit of history. We surprised Megan uh, during the mission on board the, her time on Space Station with that costume. And uh, surprisingly, she found one on board Space Station to surprise us right back. Oh, how about that? And... Uh, He's using the dark side of the force at the moment. He's going to motivate <laughs> an answer out of you. He may have heard that line uh, from both his mother and myself uh, as we try to work through elementary school. Well, a nice moment there. Thank you, Megan, for uh, doing that. And uh, I'll make sure Bob laughs at my jokes. Or other, maybe I need to just tell better jokes. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> hey, we want to catch you up on the action. We did have uh, some fod that was found in the seal uh, in the side hatch, and that was removed. The SpaceX team working quickly uh, to get that removed and cleared. They resealed the hatch and uh, repressurized it, and we have uh, confirmation just heard minutes ago of a good side leak hatch uh, check. And so uh, the team is preferring. The team is uh, moving forward. Well, the beautiful shot of the, there of uh, Dragon as we look out over the Atlantic. We've got some social media questions, and we asked you to submit them. Uh, we've had a little action that we've been dealing with this morning, so haven't been able to do a whole lot of questions, but we're going to start getting to them now. And at Con asks, what kind of personal items can the crew take with them to the International Space Station? No, Daryl, it's a great question and one that we get asked often. Uh, what kind of personal items can the crew take with them? Um, usually it's something small is probably the best answer to that question. But they're items that are per personal mementos of, of family members or otherwise. Uh, you saw my son earlier in the Darth Vader costume. <laughs> um, as you can tell, Star Wars has a special place in our family. And so we were able to glue together a small Lego ship and have my wife take that into space. Oh. Uh, I took one uh, during, during my mission as well so that we would have something that he could connect with that was part of our family, something to talk about, you know, during our, our, our family conferences. Uh, there, are, there are many small items with individuals that you want to make a personal connections with that, that typically the, the crew will take with them. They also may take something that's special to them that allows them to either remember Earth or uh, take advantage of a hobby that they have, whether it's a guitar or uh, other musical instrument, uh, small items like that. It's, it must be nice to have that connection back to Earth and your family uh, because of, uh, you know, you're up there in space, and especially now with these long-duration space missions lasting six months. And it's interesting, you mentioned the small effects. Uh, Commander Nicole Mann um, taking her wedding rings, but also some surprise special gifts for her family and a dream catcher that her mother made for her when she was a child. That's aboard uh, her personal effects, which you get about 3.3 pounds. 
of personal effects, as you mentioned. Uh, so a nice cultural uh, memento, part of her heritage as a Native American, the first Native American woman to go to space. Let's check uh, back now with California and toss it out to Hawthorne with Sandra and Jesse. Ladies. Thanks, Daryl. We are just one hour and a little over 15 minutes from launch, and it is getting more and more exciting as we get to that T-0. The crew has already ingressed the Dragon vehicle. They were helped out by our closeout team. Umbilicals were attached uh, to their suit, which provides breathing air and comms to Dragon. Suit leak checks were completed, as well as comms checks completed with the core and the launch director. And after those suit leak checks, the closeout team was able to close and seal the hatch. We just got confirmation that we did have a good leak check uh, during the first round of closing the hatch. We, they did find a piece of FOD. It was a piece of hair. We were able to open it back up, remove the FOD, and close the hatch, and then completed that uh, seal check. Um, and now the closeout team is just wrapping up. And once they wrap up uh, in that white room, they will depart the white room. And those final weather checks will be coming up soon, uh, which will be necessary before a final go, no go. And there you can see the closeout team there on your screen. Again, just wrapping up the final procedures for hatch closure there. So let's check back in with Houston for a status on the team supporting the space station on their readiness for launch. Shaniqua, how's it going? Thanks, Jesse. The team here in Mission Control Houston has polled that they are go for the launch. The International Space Station and its onboard crew are ready for Crew 5 astronauts to lift off. When Flight Director Greg Whitney polled his team, he was asking the flight controllers who work on all the different systems on board the space station if their focus areas were online and working properly. This includes life support systems, proper communication links, computers that allow us to command the station on board and their subsystems, and our ability to maneuver the space station are fully functional. The crew in orbit is awake and just finished their midday meals. They will start crew arrival preparations shortly, making sure they are ready to receive the new crew tomorrow. Mission Control Houston will continue monitoring the mission as we check off milestones for today's flight. In the meantime, I'll send it back over to Hawthorne. The International Sp Space Station Flight Control Room is ready for launch. Sandra? Thank you. Thanks, Janiqua. That's great news. And while Crew 5 is launching today, just a few months ago, we were launching another crew to the International Space Station. That is, of course, my Crew 4, who launched in April. The Crew 4 astronauts currently on board the International Space Station have spent nearly six months conducting scientific research in areas such as material science, health technologies, and plant science to prepare for human exploration beyond low Earth orbit and to benefit life on Earth. Such research also lays the groundwork for future exploration of the Moon and Mars, starting with the agency's Artemis missions. Dr. Chow Ringrin was born in Tepe, Taiwan, but spent most of his childhood overseas in England. He was an instructor and jump master with the U.S. Air Force Academy and also has a doctorate in medicine and served as a NASA flight surgeon. After he was chosen as an astronaut, Lingrid flew on Soyuz and spent 141 days in space during Expedition 44 and 45. He has a wife and three children and is the commander of Dragon Freedom. And up next is fellow airman Bob Hines. He was born in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and has a wife and three daughters. He has a Master of Science in Aerospace Engineering and served 21 years in the U.S. Air Force as a test pilot and as a fighter pilot in the F-15E. He came to NASA as a research pilot where he flew the science where he flew science missions in the WB-57. He's the pilot for NASA's SpaceX Crew 4 mission, which has been his first space flight. Now there's a couple of mission specialists on board Crew 4.
We're at the Launch Complex 39 where media are gathering, getting ready to count down the final hour as we get ready to watch Crew 5 launch into space. It is a big day, and especially here at the Kennedy Space Center where we have just been cranking out the launches, Bob. Three launches in three days from three different paths. We had uh, the Atlas V going off the fourth yesterday. We've got Crew 5, of course, from Launch Complex 39A today, and then tomorrow, SpaceX launching from their other launch pad, Pad 41. Topping. Outstanding uh, to see all that action down here at the Kennedy Space Center. And again, it's a beautiful day. I'm looking forward to seeing the Crew 5 uh, folks uh, get into orbit. Indeed, and liftoff time is still holding for noon Eastern time, 56 seconds after noon, if you want to be right on the second. We're also tracking no issues at the moment with Falcon 9 or Dragon. We did have an additional suit leak check that we performed, as well as a spacecraft leak check. Those are good to go. Dragon now good to go. The range is green. And, of course, the weather is doing fabulous here at the Kennedy Space Center. Downrange, they're watching some winds in the, uh, the abort uh, corridor, but they're looking good right now. And so the crew of Crew 5, talking about Commander Nicole Mann, Pilot Josh Cassida, and Mission Specialist Koichi Wakata and Nana Kikina, well, they donned their spacesuits in the historic crew quarters suit-up room this morning. They woke up around 4.30 a.m., donned those suits around 7 a.m. They walked out of the crew quarters building as every NASA astronaut has done since Apollo 7. And then they were transported to the pad where they climbed inside the SpaceX Dragon Endurance for its second flight. And now we are seeing them live while they await liftoff. Bob, you live this with your fellow astronaut, Doug Hurley. What is the crew doing right now at this moment? You know, Daryl, it's a, it's a good question at this point. I think you can see on the camera that what the crew is really focused on right now is uh, relaxing. You know, they've had a hectic morning, if you will, one that's very well scripted, one that's very well controlled, but one that causes them to need to be on schedule through all the individual milestones leading up to launch. That part's behind them now, and they're taking a chance to relax and catch their breath uh, before the tanking operations begin here in uh, just a few minutes. Indeed, tanking coming up as well as the launch escape system checkout and the arming that will follow. The rocket is on the pad, ready to go. And over the next hour, we will conduct a series of polls to get ready for launch. The crew will also, as I mentioned, will be arming that launch escape system and then the fueling of Falcon 9 will begin. Let's talk a little bit about the details of today's flight. Launch, of course, as we mentioned, set for a, just a few seconds after noon, a little more than an hour from now, and then Crew 5 astronauts will race towards space, reaching orbit in about 12 minutes. That's followed by a roughly 29-hour flight to dock with the International Space Station, one of the longer transit times to the ISS, and then that docking will happen at 4.57 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. Of course, we'll have coverage of that. quick history of NASA's commercial crew program. It all began with the first successful and historic test flight Dragon of SpaceX. Crew Dragon. The closeout team has departed the crew arm, and with that, ground is going to cycle the orbit tank isolation valve to equalize low flow pressure. 30 seconds until re-install. All right, they're cycling the valve there, and as well, closeout team is now departing that location that you see, 39A, they'll be uh, making their way off the pad, and that'll lead us into getting ready to fuel the rocket. Of course, I was talking about the historic test flight for my uh, partner here and co-host, Bob Benkin. Minions has spawned. His crewmate, Doug Hurley.
First blood. has been slain.
Dominating. An enemy has been slain. Your team has destroyed a turret.
Double kill.
my coworkers called a, a picnic vibe with the media and NASA social folks all joined here to watch Crew 5 launch in just Crew about access arm minutes. retraction complete. And there you heard confirmation that that crew access arm has fully retracted from the rocket. Gorgeous shot there from our flight operations team here at the Kennedy Space Center, a helicopter encircling the pad right